Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And uh, we're going to again be looking at these verses, Daniel 11, verse 17 and 18. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for all the things we find in your word, uh, the things that comfort us, uh, that reveal your power and your ability to work in our lives, as well as the events in world history, and um, that give us a faith and a confidence in the things that you have done and that are doing and that will do, that you will do. So we invite your presence now through thy spirit that you can teach us, direct us, guide us, and help us to understand the truth for this time. Be with each person, bless them, and watch over them. And may your Holy Spirit speak to all that are searching for truth. And we pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again. Now, as I spent time looking at these verses, um, there is lots of clues here uh, that we need to pay attention to. And there's things about verse 17 and verse 18 uh, that we need to pay attention to. That little details that um, when you don't look at the original Hebrew um, that you don't notice, especially the Hebrew numbers, help us as well. So um, when we looked at verse uh, 17, right, so we could see that Julius Caesar represents the papacy in our time because this is wrong right and and he's going to set his face now now this idea of we're going to see the word face in there right so that's um uh, h6440 so this is a common word in hebrew um it's often translated as as presence it's Panium, right? So it's uh, panim, I guess, or pane. Uh, it's, so it kind of reminds me of panium, but it's panim, I guess, is the best panim. It almost sounds like panium, anyway. Um, but uh, so it, it, it's really common. You see it all through. It first shows up in in Genesis because it's just such a common word, and. Uh, uh, Genesis 1, verse 2, right? So that's the first time you're going to see it in the face of the deep, right? So so it's, so this word, of course, is common, but it's, it's in these verses. And, and, and so we need to pay attention to that. Um, now, the other word um, that we're going to see is turn. That's 7725. Now, this, this word turn, we should be familiar with it's the word shuv, right? And it it has different ways that it's translated uh, based on the context. Sometimes it's just translated as again, um, but usually it's translated as turn or return or returned, right? Sometimes it's back like or bring, right? Or brought or come or restore or answer came, right? So. Lots, lots of different ways that it's translated, but the idea is, is to turn, right? So it occurs in the King James, um, uh, 1,339 times. So it's again, a very common word, but, but it's in these verses. So we're going to pay some attention to that. Um, and there are some parallels between verse 18 and verse 19, in that we have uh, turning his face, right? He's going to turn his face towards the aisles in verse 18, and he's going to turn his face, uh, which is on the next page there, towards the fort of his own land, right? Um, now, we have some other words, too. The word reproach, so that one, as we know, is backwards of 1872, so it's 2781. Now, we ran into this word before, and um, we ran into it when we were looking at um, in Judges, and I'm trying to remember exactly where that was. 
think it was in Judges. Maybe it was Joshua. Yeah, maybe it was Joshua. Rolled away the reproach of Egypt. It's that word reproach. Um, ran into there. The Lord said unto Joshua, this day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt. So when, when we look at that, uh, that's when they uh, circumcise all the people, and then they're going to have their first Passover. Okay. Now, it's, um, let's hang on, my computer's Bible program is slow. And I had to step out for a second. Uh, yeah. did, did you also cover, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming you're addressing Joshua 5, 9. Yeah. And you also looked at Genesis 30, 23. Uh, I didn't look at Genesis 30, 23, because I was just looking at where we ran into it. I didn't. Uh, well, the first, the first mention of this is Genesis 30, 23. Yeah. She conceived and bare a son and said, God hath taken away my reproach. Right. Yeah. It, it's kind of interesting because this word, um, 2781. Yeah. Is in 72 verses with 73 matches. Okay. Now, out of all of this, we have only one verse that is going to have this occur twice, this reproach. Which which one's that? I'm getting to it right now. We find it in Daniel 11.18. Oh, okay. So in Daniel 11, 18, it shows up twice. Okay. Yeah, that's right. It does. Okay. And so since, since this is, this word is repeated in Daniel eleven eighteen, is this also not pointing us to the second angel's message? Well, so it's not, it's, I'd say I don't take it as a doubling just because it's okay. in the birth twice. I mean, because this is, I mean, it's it's basically a parallel um, or a response, right? But the prince, for his own behalf, should cause the reproach offered by him to cease. Without his own reproach, he shall cause it to turn upon him. So, and and that's why, like this verse, I think what I see is more a chiastic structure. All right. That it, you know, so it starts with turn, it ends with turn, right? And then you have this reproach and reproach. And if that makes sense. Okay. So see what I'm saying? So it's not oh. so much the second angel's message. It's just that this has a chiastic structure to it. But it's also interesting to me that this same word, reproach, occurs seven times in the book of Ezekiel. Okay. In the first vision, it occurs twice in Ezekiel 5, 14, and 15. Yeah. In the second vision, it occurs in Ezekiel 16, 57. Mm -hmm. And then we have it in Ezekiel 21, 28, 22, 4, 36, 15, and 36, 30. Mm -hmm. Now, Tying it in with those visions, can we tie this in with four generations? I'm, I'm not following. Okay. You've got Ezekiel 5, 14, and 15 in the first vision, right? Yeah. Can we tie that to the first generation of Adventism? I don't know. Um so, because the three visions that you have here, you have the first, second, and the third vision. Okay. And then you're going to have, uh, in chapter 36, um, so this is going to be after, just trying to see. Yeah. So in 36, I'm trying to see which vision this is. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not sure 
what you're trying to do. So it doesn't really help me too much. Like, I, I don't know if I would do that with Ezekiel, that I would take those particular uh, chapters if you're going to have, um, you know, because you're going to be dealing with, uh, let me see. So that's going to be, which vision? So you got, just looking at all the different visions. So you got, so you got one, two, yeah. So that's the ninth vision out of the 13. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know if I would do that. That's, I don't have a reason to do it. There would have to be a lot more than just seeing this word in those four different visions. What what would you get from that by doing it? Well, at this point, we have a church that's been in an apostasy. We have those that have chosen to set aside the prophetic understandings, the first love. As they have continued, they've gotten further and further away from that first love. Now, is this according to God's will or according to God's plan? Well, no. The thing I don't understand is why would you choose that word to tie? I mean, because I could say the first, second, and third vision would be uh, the three angels' messages. That would make yep. sense. All right. And then, right. To take this ninth vision just because it has this word, there's a lot better arguments uh, to do this with the other verses. Okay. So, um, yeah, because when you look at Ezekiel, uh, that's not where I want to go, but anyway, I'll leave it there. Um, so you're going to have these thir- first three visions, and then you're going to have, um, and, and the, the fourth one is going to be the siege, right? And that makes much more sense. To have the siege be the fourth, not not the ninth. All right. That's all the same. So all those other things would apply, you know, the first three. But to just to take this this word, there's so many other things that would show that the first three are the first, second, and third angels' messages. And that the fourth vision is the fourth angel's message. Right? So that's what I'm not following, why you would... Just take this word here. Have have we, as a movement or a church, garnered the blessing of God or the shame of God from the way that so many of these situations have been occurring, especially when the back had been turned on the prophetic understanding of his word? Yeah, I understand that. I'm just saying that just taking this word in Ezekiel and then trying to say that this is the first, second, third, and fourth angel's message because that word exists in it. There's so many other words that you could find that would be similar types of meanings um, that you could apply. So that's all I'm saying. It just seems to me like uh, there's not enough information there. All right. I'm just... Okay. I'm asking so, what if. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So anyway, we, we have this symbol, and it's a symbol of July 18, 2020, right? And, and it's here in this in this section. So we know what we had had in, in putting together these verses in Daniel is we can relate it to the events that have been happening so far since... 2001 right since 9-11 right that's that's where we're sort of understanding the application for this time now we haven't really finished off verse 17 because i think we have to look at verse 18 uh to understand this so we know after the occupation of patient of egypt caesar turns his face unto the isles right so right. you say Isles, the Mediterranean basin. So this is what Caesar has done. And shall take many or or make away many, right, 
eliminate all political enemies, is what uh, Swearingen put in there, which, which may be true, but I don't know if that's what the make away many is. And then you have this prince for his own behalf, which same Mark is Mark Antony. Um, and uh, you know, so, so this, this word can refer to a military leader. So it makes sense that it applies to somebody like Mark Antony for it. But, you know, there's a whole bunch here because we have, uh, but a prince now, of course, but is not necessarily in the Hebrew. It's just a vav. It just means it's just connecting uh, clauses to to make a sentence like and, right? But for his own behalf shall cause the reproach. That is one word, right? Now, of course, the form of the word contains um, uh, ways in which they would get these other words, right? And and then you have um, offered by him to cease. Well, again, you know, we have the word cease. Now, that word cease means to rest. It's like the word for the Sabbath, 7676. So it's related to that word. It's Shabbat. Um, uh, so it's basically, you know, the same consonants, right? The vowel pointing is slightly different. Um, so you can see here that the way that this is translated, it's, it's translated so that we can see things that aren't necessarily clear in the Hebrew, like especially offered. Offered is a verb, and yet we don't have a verb saying offered by him to cease, right? We don't have offered, right? So, so I'm not sure where you get where they get offered from in uh, in this, and, and sometimes I have to look a little bit more at the Hebrew to figure that out. So, um, so when I look at the verse, and so you got uh, so so when we get this word, um, I'm just trying to see. So take away many. Uh, so the aisles. So he turns his face into aisles. Yeah. So just so little in the Hebrew here to get so much in the English. Now then, then you have the word uh, capture, right? So capture uh, rabbiim. That means many. So it just says uh, and captured many. Right. He turned his face towards aisle. He captured many. And then uh, vaha shabbat, so that's shabbat, shabbat, right? And ceased, right? Now, now it's it's the hypho form of the word, so it's it's a third person masculine singular. singular. So in Hebrew, the hypho um, is. So it's a causative action in the act of voice. So he causes something to cease, right? So that means he doesn't cease, but he's causing something to cease, right? So that's why the thing that he causes to receive, to cease, is the reproach. Okay? But to say, but a prince for his own behalf, Oh, let, let me go back here. But a prince just says, for his own behalf shall cause the reproach offered by him to cease. It, nothing about his own behalf, right? So, so he causes something to cease, right? Which is the reproach. And then when we look at uh, this next word, so, uh, and, and the way that they put it is that you're going to have, and, and he causes to cease, then it has the word, the prince, um, the reproach, and, and that's going to be in the, in the feminine singular. So it's, it's not, it, it, which, which then, 
has some problems with it in the way that this is translated. So now it says shall cause the reproach, but nothing about offered by him. Okay. And then, um, yeah, so you're going to have not reproach, uh, so the, yeah, so I don't know. I don't, don't quite understand why this, so, so he doesn't have his own reproach and it will turn. So I'm trying to figure out how they're translating that, why they're translating it this way. So, so when I look at the words, I don't see what they're saying. Like I don't see, but a prince for his, for his own behalf shall cause the reproach offered him by him to cease. I don't see that in the Hebrew, right? It's like they've added a bunch of words to fit in with how they understand the history. Where, you know, if you look at like Young's literal translation, he says, afterward, he shall turn his face to the coastlands. He shall capture many of them, but a commander shall put an end to his insolence. Right? Indeed, he shall turn his insolence back upon him. So his his reproach, they call it. In King James here, they say insolent. You know, so it's, it's, now still a lot of these translators are trying to put this in, um, that, that is, they are interpreting it. They have something that they understand. Um, like even the Bishop's Bible just says, but a prince shall cause his shame to light upon him. Beside that, he shall cause his own shame to turn upon himself. Right? So quite a bit different than the King James. And so, I mean, I can see that this applies to Julius Caesar, but I think they're trying to put too much in there. And and the question then, see, see, there's some things about this here. So if we look at this word reproach again, um, you know, it's going to refer to, well, in Ezekiel, it's, it's a reproach or a shame. Uh, we see it in Daniel uh, 12. Verse two. So we're going to see it there where it's going to be shame and, and that's going to be, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth, earth shall awake, um, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Right. And the word contempt there is one eight six zero. So you get that symbol of. Uh, the 186 days from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month. Um, um, you know, it's translated as rebuke, rebuke, rebuke. It's in Jeremiah 15, 15. So, you know, I've, for thy sake, I have suffered rebuke or shame, right? And, uh, I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. That's Joel 2 verse 19, right? So the point is, um, this word reproach, I think it has much more a, a religious meaning than, you know, than would be here. So, and, and the question is, question is, so I don't even understand the reproach offered by him to cease. I'm not sure what that, what they're trying to get from that verse. So, so I'm just having trouble really getting my mind around what this verse is, how it's to be applied to Caesar. Right. So we know he's going to turn his face onto the aisles. But then there is this chiastic structure, right? Um, so we have this, this, he turns his face towards the aisles, right? And when he does so, um, He's going to capture many, right? So he's going to take captive many. And then you have this prince that will cause the reproach to cease, right? So this reproach, this shame to cease. Yeah. So there's a, going to be a prince that will cause this reproach to cease. Now, to say, well, that's Mark Anthony. Doesn't you know, make sense. It doesn't. <laughs> right? 
So, so that's where I'm having a little bit of trouble here. It's just, it's not quite clicking with me. You know, that when I look at the Hebrew and I look at how this has been interpreted, um, I don't know if Mark Anthony's really introduced here, but they're taking this word prince, which, which is like a commander. Now it comes from the word like to cut off. Um, Right. So, or to make a judgment. So it could be a magistrate as well. Um, so this word, um, so I'm going to look it up again here. So, you know, it, it occurs 12 times in the Bible. Now, one place it occurs is Judges 11, 11, right? And that's going to be when Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, the people made him head and captain, right? So that word captain is that same word over them. And Ephtha uttered all his words, or Jephthah uttered all of his words before the Lord in Mitzvah, right? So you got Jephthah um, is made this, this um, head, right? And captain. So you got um, Rosh and this word Katzen is what it is. Um, Right, we have it in, of course, Judges 8, 11, um, but it's mostly like rulers, captains, guides. It's in Joshua, um, it's in Joshua 10, 24, and it's talking about the captains there. So these are the captains of, of God, you know, the, of the men of war. It's used in Micah for princes of the house of Israel that abhor judgment and pervert all equity. So this is unjust. Judges, I don't know judgment. Micah 3 verse 1, same idea. Uh, Proverbs 25, 15. By long forbearing is a prince persuaded and a soft tongue breaketh the bone, right? So this idea of a prince is, it's somebody who, who makes judgment. Okay. So it's not just, just a captain, but there's, there's this magistrate idea attached to it or like a ruler. Something in, in that sense. But I don't know how else to apply this. So, and a prince shall cause the reproach to cease. Now, the th- thing that this reminds me of is, is Daniel chapter 11, or not chapter 11, chapter 9. So when you go there, Daniel 9... So you're going to have, um, he should confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause sacrifice and oblation to cease. Right. So think about that. Um, cause it's the same Hebrew word, the cease word, Shabbat. Um, now, of course, we know here in the context, uh, there's going to be the Messiah, the prince, right, in this chapter, or in this section, this prophecy. And you also have uh, the prince that shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. So you've got these two different princes. Now, those are different words. Nagid, it means commander, civil, military, or religious, generally um, in the abstract plural. So it's it's not doesn't look like it's a related word or anything. So I don't know. Any any thoughts about this verse? Because you have a prince causing a reproach to cease. And that reminds me of, of Daniel 9, you know, verse you know, 24 to 27. But it's it's also tied with Daniel 9, 16. In 9, 16, you got... Uh, uh, yeah, the reproach there, right? Correct. According to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from the city Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to you, 7 one to all that are about us. Okay, so... I mean, at this <clears throat> at this point... Where prophecy is concerned, mm-hmm. thy people are become a disgrace 
a rebuke. They become shame. Right. How else, how else can we approach this? Well, that's what I've been trying to figure out because to me, there seems to be some reference here to these prophecies in Daniel chapter nine. Well, it's a very direct reference to it. Yeah, I think so. Right. So you got this reproach. Now, um, so he's going to turn, shoot his face, I mean, unto the isles and she'll take many captives. Right. Right. Really? Okay. A prince. Right. So it doesn't say but, but, you know, and a prince. Shall. Uh, shall cause the reproach to cease. Right. Right. So make to cease the reproach. Right. That's what he's going to do. The shame. And then it says, uh, without, with, now say, to say without his own reproach, um, again, this, I mean, it says without reproach, he shall cause it to turn, right? So his own reproach, I'm not so sure that I could support this own reproach. Um, so the thing about reproach is it's always in the feminine, feminine singular. So, so if you're going to say, if you're going to apply a masculine to it, it doesn't make sense. Okay. So this reproach is not his reproach. It's her reproach. Her shame. Does that make sense? So I'm not, I'm not really sure how to how to understand this verse. Because they just have the. Now, we could say, of course, it could be it. Um, but when you can't, you can't say his own reproach. Because the reproach is feminine. And there's nothing about his, nothing that makes it his reproach. Now, it's going to cause it to turn, Right. And, and so that idea is it, it, this reproach is going to turn upon him. So you, you, I'm just trying to understand this, right? So I know it's, we're kind of stuck here in, in this rut, right? So then it says, he shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. So that's going to be Julius Caesar, right? That's how we've always understood this. Uh, so, Julius Caesar in the Ides of March in 44 uh, BC when he's going to be um, assassinated, right? And then we know in verse 20, then she'll stand up in his estate a razor of tra- a taxes. So that's going to be Caesar Augustus, right? And then we're going to have verse 21, Tiberius Caesar. Now, could there be something here in the sense no, no, Christ doesn't come in, of course, until the time of Caesar Augustus. That's when he's going to be born, right? Um, but could this be some reference to Christ sort of maybe as a foreshadowing of what's going to happen to these Caesars? That, that, that it's in this time that we have set up all of these events uh, connected to the, the crucifixion. Is there some way that we can connect, even though it's not till the time of Augustus Caesar, but connect this time of Julius Caesar to this history? Okay. Now, so Julius Caesar dies in the Ides of, Ides of March, and, and he's going to make this uh, Julian calendar, what, in 46, right? He's going to die in 44. Um So do, do we have um, so so would he so does he die on March fifteenth in forty four? Okay, well, I'm gonna put this up here. Okay, so yeah, so March fifteenth on the Julian calendar in forty four BC. That's when he dies. Okay, so you're gonna have um, it's the death of Julius Caesar. 
Okay, so what actually happens when Julius Caesar dies? So how, how does the government then um, operate? So you have the death of Julius Caesar. Does it segue into the second triumvirate? Yeah, so you're going to have Augustus and Mark Anthony and Cleopatra, right? Is that who it is? No, Cleopatra is not part of that triumvirate. Okay. okay, so it's, but it's Mark Anthony, Octavius, so whatever you say. Uh, verse 18, which simply means the one who's uh, taking uh, these uh, places, it's uh, Julius Caesar, right? Um, yeah. Yes, because uh, from, from where, where I'm, 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 I'm reading from. Okay, so okay. you've got in this second triumvirate, you have Mark Antony, yeah. okay. Octavian, yeah. and Lepidius. Lepidius, yeah. And okay. this this was had given them practically absolute power, and it began on the twenty seventh of November of forty three BC for a term of five years. It was okay. renewed, renewed in 37 BC for another five years, which expired in 32 BC. Okay, so so what's happening between those triumphants then? Okay, you're saying it's just it's going from 43, so it's going to be 10 years altogether. Right. So okay, so that's going to start in 43. So from the time that Julius Caesar dies in. Uh, the Ides of March, so March 15th, 44 BC. There's going to be like a year and a half that there is no, nobody's running the country or just the Senate or what's happening. I'm looking. So I'm just not convinced that it's Mark Anthony that, that is this prince and that this reproach, I mean, I don't see how that would apply to Julius Caesar. Because how did Mark Anthony cause a reproach of Julius Caesar? Or so cause a reproach offered by him? This is the reproach. I I don't understand it. So, (laughs) and and that's probably my lack of of, of understanding this history. But this is not something I've looked to in detail before, dealing with the death of Julius Caesar and what ended up happening afterwards. So here, when uh, Julius Caesar was uh, was assassinated, we find that uh, Brutus is the one who arranged uh, the O assassination. Yeah, yeah, I know about yeah. that. Okay. Yeah, because he, you know, he says something to Brutus, or you know, uh, so but, you know, it's just sketchy in my mind, but something about Brutus um, dealing with the assassination. Okay. Then it's going to be November 27th in 43 that the triumvirate forms. Is that what they say? Yeah. And it's, it's going to be renewed. Um, so what they say, yeah. <clears throat> okay. So just dealing with Mark Anthony, he's one of the consuls for 444 BC and on June 2nd, 44, was able to push through a legal legislation assigning himself the provinces of Cisapolene and Transapolene Gaul, displacing their existing governors. Okay. Anthony also persuaded the Senate to disarm Marcus Brutus and Cassius, the two leading tyrannicides, giving them grain supply assignments. Both men viewed these assignments as insults, later compounded by their assignment to minor provinces. So you've got basically Mark Anthony is... Um, you know, sort of running things, but he's just a consul. Relations between Antony and Caesar's legal heir, Octavian, also started to break down. Octavian was successful in attracting some of Caesar's veterans from Antony's camp, undercutting Antony's military support. Okay. Um, the Battle of Mutina on the 21st of April. And then on August 19th of 43, 
Octavian and his forces reached Rome. Okay. So a lot of stuff happening here in this history. They proclaim Julius Caesar a god. You know, this is God who could die. Um, that's in 42. So, so the triumvirate, I mean, it's uh, triumvirate. And I know that it's going to be in, we got going to have Anthony and Cleopatra being involved. Hmm. So the, it, it expired on December 31st, 33 BC. So you're going to have this lasting for just a little over 10 years. It is interesting from the time that uh, Julius Caesar is assassinated to the forming of the triumvirate is 622 days. Is it 622 or 626? Um, 622. Okay, because I was taking the Julian day and subtracting the Julian day from when Caesar is assassinated to the uh, Julian day when it was when the triumvirate was established. November 27th. So March 15, 44 to November 27, 43 is 622. Okay. So there it is. I don't know why I had this twice, though. But I, I don't know what it all means at this point. Right? So we're going to have to figure this out. But see, and I just dislike the King James because there's nothing about but a prince for his own behalf shall cause the reproach offered by him to cease. There's no offered. There's nothing about his own behalf. And, and, and so the verb there is you have, you have a prince who causes to cease, to cease, cease a reproach, the reproach, right? So that's all it says, right? That's, that's all the Hebrew says. A prince causes a reproach to cease. Prince causes to cease, cease and reproach. So all of these other things in there just aren't there. And then uh, now, now it says without his, without now. So here again, we're going to have without. So that means not uh, his reproach. Um, or without. I'm just going to look that up. So that's little. Weird. Um, right. So when you look at this, this uh, here in the Hebrew, I know you guys don't read Hebrew here, but um, so you can see that word cease. You can see the form of the word. It's plural and it's a hypho form. Um, and there's the prince, right, who's going to cause to cease uh, the reproach. So there is your reproach there's the prince uh there's the cease and 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 the order of this i mean hebrew word order doesn't always mean a lot so we got this word here captain 7227 um just looking at this whole thing so to return the face turns his face Towards the Isles and caps captures many. So this word Rab they have as many. It also means captain. And then a prince here. So it says basically um, to cease causes to cease the prince uh, reproach. Right. Um, so I don't, don't quite get why they're translating. If, you know, sometimes I just don't understand something, but that's a feminine singular noun. Just checking it in another spot. So without reproach. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, uh, any ideas here? Of, of how we could understand this. 
How would this apply to Mark Anthony? If we just take what the Hebrew says, not what the King James says. I don't see that it does apply to Mark Anthony. Yeah, I don't think it can. But then does it apply to Christ? So the one thing is we have Christ acting here in Daniel chapter 11. So the one thing that we sort of have forgotten, and, and I was trying to get into this yesterday a little bit. Um, but when we look at Daniel chapter 11, it starts with Daniel chapter 10, right? And it's about uh, Christ interfering in the events of this world, right? He's going to work upon uh, the heart of Cyrus. He's going to work. He's already worked upon the heart of uh, Darius the Mede, right? And then we have these events that are going to be described. And, and, and I would think, you know, that God is introduced in that verse, verse 17, which of course God here would be Christ. So this is, this is kind of a radical interpretation of this. I don't know if, you know, people can accept it. But, but here we can see that Christ is going to uh, intervene in these affairs, right? That he, he's overseeing all of these events. And so, you know, God in his providence has given this woman, Cleopatra, to Caesar, right? And, and that, that's how I've interpreted that. And, and then we didn't really go into the rest of it because we're not quite sure what it means yet. So we started looking at verse 18. But she shall not stand, neither exist, right? Exist for him or whatever it is, you know, so be for him, right? After this, Caesar turns his face unto the isles. And so we can, we can see that that's clear. And he's going to take many captive. But uh, to cause to cease, a prince causes to cease the reproach. So, you know, why would that be introduced here? Why would Christ be introduced here in this history? Because we do know that the Jewish forces... Uh, that were loyal to Caesar, right? They're going to be involved in what, what happens in this history, right? So if we go back to our history, we have um, the Seventh-day Adventists uh, taking spiritual formation with the Protestants, okay? So you have these different powers all being set up in our history, right, after 9-11. And, and if the Pope, after he has conquered Egypt, right, he's going to turn his face onto the Isles, what would the Isles be? You know, here it's Mediterranean Basin, historically. But we looked at, um, at Isles, and what did we find? Where, where do we find this? What, what did we find about the Isles, 339? What did we Right. So we went to Isaiah 11, 11, right? And Isaiah 11, 11 is a verse that Ellen White quotes in early writings, page 74, right? That is, it's written as September 23rd. The Lord showed me that he shall set his hand, uh, stretch out his hand a second time to recover the remnant of his people, right? But it's, it's actually not September 23rd. It's October 23rd. <laughs> It's just a typo that got, kept getting repeated. Okay. A mistake on James White's parts, part when he was putting together the, the review, the first issue. So he, he misread it and because it probably didn't say October 23rd, it probably just said uh, 23rd instant, I-N-S-T, which just means of that month. And if he's looking at a lot of documents, he may have thought it was a continued document. But anyway, um, so this verse is quoted. And so we started talking about this, that the, historically this is going to be, the second time is going to be coming out of Babylon. But we know that we can make other applications to it, that the first time and the second time 
have different applications, right? Because we can do line upon line. Okay, so now it's in Isaiah 11.11, which is this important symbol, and it ties us to early writings. And and it's going to talk about uh, the isles, right? So it's going to say, recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, and from Hamath, and the islands of the sea, right? So, so this is where God's people are spread. So what, what is the islands of the sea as a symbol? Mostly you're going to see it in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, right? It's not going to, I mean, it is in Genesis 10 verse 5. When they, these isle, isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, right? Everyone after his tongue, after their families and the nations. So when you see the islands of the sea, the sea are people's multitudes, nations and tongues, languages, right? So when he, when the Pope the papacy turns his face towards the isles. What is he turning his face toward? And he's going to, um, right? He's going to turn his face unto the isles, the islands, right? Are we getting an idea of what's happening here? Is this making more sense? For me, it's raising more questions. Okay. So what kind of questions do you have raised? I'm having to consider these. I'm looking at something else as, as we've been going through this, but this, yeah. this is making, I mean, it's making sense. I mean, this prince for his own behalf being Mark Antony has just not, it, it just isn't clicking with me. Well, especially when you look at the Hebrew, right? So. So I would just say that the isles represent all of all of the people in all of these different groups, right? These are, um, you know, people, multitudes, nations, tongues, whatever, something like that. Spell tongues wrong. Okay. <clears throat> So these aisles are all of these people, that is, all of these diverse groups. So that's what the papacy is doing. And it's uh, going to take away or make away many, right? So it shall take many. So, so this is something that's happening in the history of the Sunday law. Now, they're saying here, eliminate all political enemies. But this is more a type of captivity. So I, I don't know how to, how we would apply this then to Julius Caesar, what he does, but we do know that he, he's, he's going to conquer lots of er areas. Now they're applying this to eliminating all political enemies, but I'm not sure if that's what's being referred to here or not historically. But then, but we have a prince, right? So, so to me, this makes more sense, this to be Christ. You know, he's he's the one that's in this vision, right? Maybe I, I should say Michael. And that, that, in a manner of looking at this, would then remove Mark Antony. Yeah. So for his own behalf, what does Mark Antony become? I, I don't know what you mean. Well, if... If we're placing Christ in this, do we then remove this reference to Mark Antony? Yeah, of course. Swearing and, and, and Uriah Smith had been using. Yeah, I would take Mark Antony out of there. But a prince, Michael, your prince, shall cause the reproach to cease. Now, we'd have to say, well, how does Christ do that? And why in this history, in this time of Julius Caesar? Right? There's nothing about for his own behalf that just doesn't exist in the in the Hebrew at all. So I'm not sure how they got that in there. 
and even offered by him. That's not in the Hebrew. There's nothing about that. So it's just, but a prince shall cause the reproach to cease. That's all it says. Now, this could be referring to something later, but we would need to understand what it is that Julius Caesar has done that then would re- then we would have to bring in that Christ, Michael, the one who's who's all a part of this vision, who's doing this interference in this story, why he's introduced here. So I definitely would take out eliminate all political enemies. So I don't think that that's what's being talked about. This taking taking many or making away many. Because it's it's a type of captivity. It's nothing to do with eliminating people. So the question, you know, who does Julius Caesar take captive? Now we would say the world, right? So, I mean, when is the Roman Empire? When does the Roman? Uh, we know when we get emperors, right? But it becomes a universal empire. It controls this whole area at what time like how do we understand the rise of rome and when it takes over so we we know it's a republic now we get the word emperor you know it's related to empire but but when when does it start i mean from a biblical perspective now the roman empire technically starts in 27 bc Right, according to Wikipedia, it's founded. But at some point, from a biblical perspective, when would it be considered an empire? When would it start? I mean, obviously, it exalts itself to establish the vision. Now, we're not going to have until 31 BC that that Egypt is conquered, right? Technically whatever it's called, I um, can't think of the name of the battle. So there, is there any way that we can put this history as Christ being, you know, causing the reproach to cease in this history? Is there something to do with Israel in this history? First, going back to 31. Sorry, sorry. I apologize. Going back to 31 BC, are you talking about the Battle of Actium? Yeah, Actium, yeah. So we know Pompey, uh, he's going to conquer Israel in 63. So is there something? What's that? He's going to conquer Syria. And by Syria, he will take control of Israel. Right, yeah. So he's going to conquer Syria. He's going to take control of Israel in 63. Then we're going to have, in this history here, you're going to get to, you know, so there's stuff happening in Israel that I'm not, I don't know much about. Maybe there's something in the history of Israel that would apply that, you know, maybe it's in the Apocrypha or something. I think there's probably quite a bit about this in, in the Apocrypha. Yeah. Okay. But, you know, so when we talk about Christ, you know, taking away the reproach, what we would think, well, that's going to be, you know, the cross or something like that. Um, But and maybe it's referring to what's going to happen later. Right. Okay. It's not saying that it's happening then, but it's mentioning it here. Right. So that a reproach occurs at this time that. That is going to be taken away later. Now it's going to say, you know, without his own reproach, he shall cause it to turn up on him. Now, so we would just say, well, you know, this is, um, I don't, I don't know. Uh, if we're going to, if we're going to make that application, how we would look at the rest of this verse. Right. So, so. Introduced here is this reproach. Um, he's going to cause this reproach to cease. Now, could this be 
this next part, also be referring to Christ. He doesn't have his own reproach, but he's going to cause it to turn upon himself. So that this is, again, referring to, you know, something that's going to happen in the future. But it's introduced here for a reason. Okay. It's kind of intriguing. I mean, but we we could be wrong what we're trying to do here. But I, I just don't see Mark Anthony in there. And I don't, you know, see these, uh, the translation there um, making sense. So he doesn't have his own reproach. This would be this prince, right? If it's Christ, Michael, your prince. But he's going to take the reproach upon himself. But the question still is, why would this be introduced in this part of Daniel chapter 11? Why would the crucifixion be mentioned here if that's what's actually happening? Okay, so so these these are things that we're going to have to really uh, think about. We just got a few more minutes here. But, but do you understand what I'm doing here? So that we would have to look at this history and say, Okay, all of a sudden it's going to mention that Michael, your prince, he's going to take this reproach upon himself. So this would have to be something to deal with God's people. And right. and, and so it would also have to be the fact that you have um, Julius Caesar turning his face onto the aisles, Right. So the islands of the sea. And, and and so this so so some way that's connected. This captivity, he shall take me, take away many, or make away many, or shall take many, however you want to translate that. So he's going to take captive God's people at this time. Now we know that of course that happened in sixty three. But maybe there's something that's happening in this history that's sort of taking them captive, not just conquering Jerusalem. And and so that's why Michael then is introduced. that He's going to take away this reproach. So I don't know the history. I, I don't know what's happening in, in Jerusalem at this time after they've been taken captive by Rome. Right after Jerusalem falls, you know, and that's going to be, you know, 20 years earlier. Now, of course, it could be, you know, not just addressing what specifically just happened. It could just deal with the whole idea that that Rome has conquered this area. Right. Right. So so we may say, well, it's just referring to this not just what's happening right when he turns his face towards the aisles, but this whole history when uh, Rome conquers this area, right? And and so now is introduced the idea, your reproach is going to fall upon Michael, your prince. He's going to take this reproach upon himself, but it's introducing it here. It's It's intriguing. I don't know if it's right. We'd have to have more to show that it's correct. Now, I do want to point uh, to one word here that uh, is kind of interesting. And um, this is the word to cease. Now, this word 7673 um, is, uh, you know, Shabbat, right? Uh, to rest or to end, you know, an activity. Um and, and it's it's 21 years and three days, and I don't know if that's significant. But if you take seven six seven three, it's going to count 21 years and three days. And I and I ran into this before somewhere. And I, 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 that's why I know it. I can't remember where that 21 years was. I was trying to figure it out before the study. Well, let me think here. Now we are dealing with you know 21 year 21 years after the. Uh, you know, the siege of Jerusalem, but I don't know if I can put it down to exactly uh, 7,673 days to something in 42 BC. 
And they don't really have an exact date for it. At least I can't find one. Okay, so we're going to have to come back to this tomorrow. So hopefully this is interesting to people and you don't think we're going like way off track. Um, but if we are, you know, we need to be put back on track. But I, I like this idea that we see, you know, Michael, you know, and, and, you know, the one that's being talked about in Chapter 10, being involved in what's happening in this history that he's mentioned occasionally. To me, it makes a lot of sense, but that's just to me, maybe. Okay, well, let's let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study today. Uh, we pray for one another. We know, Lord, that um, there's many things that we need to understand, and we face trials in our lives that um, make us more dependent upon you. And we just pray that as we walk with you each day, uh, that we can know that you are near, that we can feel your hand in ours, and that we can be guided by you. Bring us together again to study your word is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.